So first, the the title is a joke. So if you came here for life ruining advice, sorry, <laughs> it's quite the opposite. In fact, I will try to convey some life affirming advice from quantum physics. This talk may exist on the internet forever, and that's a scary thought because future Chris Ferry will not be the same person. I hope as the person sitting here. So I'll aim not to say something that will make them uncomfortable. What I'm, I'm about to say is a very concise and simplified summary of my mind at a particular snapshot in time. So the popular premise of like a lecture is that an expert will expound on facts that convey deep truths one is only able to distill through a lifetime of study. But when people speak, you are listening to their opinions, not facts from some secret tome that they have deciphered. Now, granted, listening to the opinions of experts is a much wiser option than listening to random internet influencers. So good choice. But know that upfront, these are my opinions. I have decades of professional experience in quantum physics, but I'm not going to give you the textbook description of it that you can find anywhere. I'm going to give you the personal lessons that I've learned because I think like you, I went all the way down the rabbit hole of quantum physics searching for one thing, truth. So who am I anyway? And why is that important? Uh, the interpretation of a speaker's message is influenced by a complex interplay of factors, including the listener and the speaker's implicit biases, social context, past experiences, and personal beliefs. So often we don't know what those are, so I'm making assumptions about you, the listener, and you are making assumptions about me. And these assumptions are used to fill in gaps and make predictions about the message that I'm trying to convey. It's not easy. In fact, a great listener does most of the work in a conversation. So let me help you out a little bit by telling you about myself so that that prediction engine up there has less work to do. I'll actually start at the end. So I'm a professor at the University of Technology, Sydney's Center for Quantum Software and Information. I get paid to teach, mentor students, and do research. I'm also the founder of a startup company, democratizing access to quantum computing by building educational tools like the one you see here in the center of the screen. And finally, I'm an author. I write popular science books for children uh, and adults. <laughs> so it's an odd juxtaposition to be sure, but there's a common thread in explaining complex topics in an easily digestible form. While this book here on the right contains some humorous derision towards those that abuse quantum physics, it is primarily a tool to help people understand what quantum physics is by delineating all the things that it isn't. So to me, quantum physics is nothing but a mathematical model to help answer practical questions about the world. This I come by honestly. In reality, I'm not a physicist or an author. I'm a mathematician. My over 10 years of formal training were in applied mathematics. While there are plenty of applied mathematicians in the world, there are not many that reach a popular audience. It would have been much easier for you if I could be pigeonholed as a scientist or an academic or a physicist or philosopher or something that, is, is has a common sort of thread behind it. Uh, but I'm kind of all of those things, but none of them at the same time. I, I'm a mathematical storyteller, and I hope that this offers a genuinely new perspective for you. So let's start with, well, what is an applied mathematician? So you, you can find scientists talking uh, on, on YouTube or in the public all over the place and, and there's there's common threads and, and and they often revolve around this picture behind me, you know, pictures of space that's supposed to invoke some uh, cosmic uh, thing inside of you. But actually the silent majority, vast majority of scientists are what I would call everyday pragmatists. They get on with their work and they really have no opinion to declare on deeply philosophical matters. So that even the one of the greatest physicists in the world uh, Sir Isaac Newton famously dodged questions about why his universal theory of gravity worked at all. He probably wouldn't even have said things like uh, hypothesis non fingo, uh, I frame no hypothesis at all had people not bothered him endlessly about it. 
Like these were questions that his theory was not prepared to answer. And he knew that. With his immense influence, he could have easily swayed the opinions of other scientists and you know the masses by making sweeping statements about the nature of reality derived from the authority of his theory, but he didn't. So why is that? He didn't do it because Isaac Newton was an applied mathematician. He identified part of the world, abstracted away all the details, created a model for it, and finally invented a mathematical theory to study it. For hundreds of years, and still to this day, we understand and control a large part of the world through the lens of a simple mathematical picture due to Newton, we know is wrong. A map will never be the territory, and all of our understanding of reality is actually mastery of the map. And the same can be said about everything else. The problem in the world is that people think questions ought to have simple answers. In science, they apparently do, but it's only in our cartoon pictures of the world, the map. And these black and white pictures often have sharp lines. We call them laws separating false dichotomies. When we have a question and we ask why, 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 the chain must end at a boundary which is held to be the ultimate authority. And more often than not, the level of detail required is not captured by the model constructed. And so we end up with a lie that no one intended. And the lie is formed because there is no real line separating black and white. There are infinitely many shades of gray. This is not a suggestion that we capture every minute detail of the world. That wouldn't be helpful. What we ought to do is accept it and the fact that progress is made through working assumptions we know to be untrue and willing to be amended when it becomes prudent to do so. The acceptance of this underlies the beauty of applied mathematics. It's kind of like an unspoken credo. Understanding and controlling the world requires models of its features that simplify them, if only by what they ignore, in such a way to be useful. Taking up this torch is remarkably easy once you're oriented. Of course, the challenge is to find simplicity in the world, and this is the art of applied mathematics. We build models to penetrate the complexity of life, carve away details irrelevant to the matter at hand, and reveal a mechanism for understanding so that we can see the beauty not in how the world is, but in how it could be. So the philosophy of applied mathematics is implicitly metanormative in the sense that what one ought to do is strive to create guides for others in the most useful form possible. In this view, all of science, philosophy, spirituality, and other human intellectual enterprises are frameworks for writing guidebooks to explore features of the world. These guides are stories, not compendia filled with minutia of the world, but parables meant to enhance our understanding and control over it. This is what an applied mathematician does. They tell mathematical stories. I spent most of my professional life telling stories about quantum physics. So I guess we should answer. What is quantum physics? <laughs> so quantum physics um, is often synonymous with quantum mechanics or quantum theory. I'll use them to mean the same thing. Uh, a branch of science that humans use to describe the behavior of matter and energy at the smallest scales, such as things like atoms, electrons, photons, and quite successfully so, I might add. Though, as I'll soon discuss, the theory now applies well beyond this regime. At the microscopic level, though, the familiar and intuitive rules of classical physics of Newton that worked well to describe our everyday experiences no longer apply. Instead, the particles and their interactions are governed by a set of new rules that were developed in the first half of the 20th century. The rules contain several counterintuitive principles, and we give them names such as wave-particle duality, quantum entanglement, the uncertainty principle, and superposition, to name a few. But in repeating these things that are said about quantum physics, I feel like I've already sinned by suggesting that it must be grounded and understood in terms of real physical things, which don't exist in the way we are compelled to imagine them. The principles defy our common sense and challenge our preconceived notions of reality, but they also have been confirmed time and time again through rigorous experimentation. The field of quantum physics has its fingerprints on every scientific discovery and technological innovation since its inception. Without quantum physics, we would not know what we are made of, let alone what stars and galaxies are made of, nor would we understand the mechanisms of chemistry or biology and that DNA encodes the recipe to make what we are. 
Without quantum physics, we wouldn't even be able to accurately explain why the sky is blue. Quantum physics has revolutionized our modern technology-infused world with innovations such as lasers, transistors, atomic clocks, and every medical scan you've ever had, or perhaps seen on TV. <laughs> By the end of this century, quantum technologies will have transformed our society many times over. It's been said in more ways than one that nobody understands quantum physics, yet here we are, using it to make the most accurate predictions ever made by humanity. The fact of the matter is, many people understand quantum physics, and that's how we can build all of this stuff. The problem is that, apparently, nobody can provide a genuinely honest and useful explanation for their own understanding. Physicists often resort to oversimplification and subtle analogies that ought to come with very big disclaimers or not be used at all outside of academia. It's not their fault, though, as we simply don't have a good language to discuss these things, nor do we really have the incentive to do it outside of our jobs. So to really kind of drive this home, I want to give you an example of one of the, the, one of the concepts that I talked about before. Um, so I named a bunch of them. You've, you've probably heard of them if you've if you've seen anything or watched any YouTube videos about, about quantum physics, wave particle duality, quantum entanglement, uncertainty principle. These are sort of the uh, popular ones, but the most, uh, the simplest to misuse, uh, and I think the simplest to explain is the concept of superposition. So the idea of superposition is quite central to quantum physics. It's often oversimplified as particles existing in multiple locations at once. But in truth, superposition refers to the mathematical representation of a quantum object of study state. So you can imagine a particular state as like a spreadsheet filled with numbers. And those numbers encode all of the information required to predict the outcomes ex of experiments performed using that identified object. We often refer to objects as being in states, and that terminology is not actually limited to quantum physics, of course. So it might be said that you are in a state of happiness, but this implies that happiness is somehow a real objective thing, or that states in general are objective properties of things in the world. But happiness is not objective. Happiness is just a shorthand concept for a model of human behavior. It's a bunch of expectations that I should have for your actions. Like, for example, that you'll smile or laugh or just in general, engage positively. So happiness has just this shorthand for a model of what I expect you to do. Another abused two-letter word is. We might ask, what color is the apple? And we definitely don't answer if white light shines on this apple, I will perceive what I have been told is the sensation of redness. No, we just say the apple is red, even though red isn't a real physical state, but it's a sensation. For our everyday experiences, all of this is unproblematic, though I guess if you like Google, pink is not a color, <laughs> you can see it's not hard to find pedantry in just about anything. Quantum states are also not objective things that particles pass through or possess. They are mathematical tools that help us understand and predict the behavior of quantum objects in various situations. There are basic states that predict intuitive things, like if the position of the object is measured, I will definitely find it to be here. Or if the position of the object is measured, I will definitely find it to be there. But again, instead of writing out these sentences or speaking them, they could quickly turn into long paragraphs or even books. We just use the same conceptual shorthand and say the object is in the state of being here, or simpler still, the object is just is here or, or there. But it's important to keep in mind that states are mathematical objects. The state summarized as object is here is actually a spreadsheet of numbers, as is the state object is there. Quantum mechanics use these numbers and know how to manipulate them to create experiments that will produce outcomes that they expect. And that's how we get all this great technology. Now, being made of numbers, you can easily imagine what happens next. Let's add them together, giving us a new spreadsheet. So this is a new state. 
It's a valid description of the object. It can be in this state. But now what does that mean? Well, technically, it doesn't mean anything beyond what I've already said. The state is nothing but information that provides predictions for an experiment performed using that object. Now, of course, this is deeply unsatisfying <laughs> to you as it has been to generations of physicists. It's very tempting to say that the superposition, the adding of these two things uh, here and there is a state we can call here and there, right? So we've taken the here state and the there state, we've added them together, called that superposition, and now we want to say that this is a new state both here and there. And just as we simplified an object being described as if the position of the object is measured, it will definitely be found here to the object is just here. Most people simplify superposition states to the phrase, the object is both here and there at the same time in two places at once. <laughs> so I hope you can see now that this is kind of a ridiculous statement that could have easily been avoided had we not relied on this oversimplified shorthand notation. Okay, so now is a good place to pause um, and reiterate that states are mathematical objects that we assign to phenomena we use in our theories to make predictions. Sometimes the states can be faithfully interpreted through analogies to everyday experiences here and there. We make copious use of these analogies as they provide enormous conceptual economy. However, many states have no direct connection to our everyday experience. And using the typical analogies quickly results in nonsensical statements and a lot of confusion. So for the sake of con concreteness, um, I want you to imagine these tables represent the states of some typical subatomic particle like an electron, the thing that carries negative charge um, through your cables that are probably lying around. Um, so I think just to, you know, to be clear, an electron is never in two places at the same time. In fact, if an electron is in one of these superposition states, it's somewhat problematic to even be calling it an electron. So electrons are often considered to be particles. And if they're particles, then if nothing else, they should have a definite location. The fact that electrons can be in superposition states of here and there forces us to revisit this idea that particles even exist at all. In reality, there's no such thing as particles. They're only phenomena that occasionally behave as if they were particles. So what an electron in superposition is then is just information. And such a state provides information heavily couched in the context of the rest of the physics that you have to you know, go to university to, to learn about how to use that allows us to make accurate predictions about what will happen next. Okay, so um, when an object is isolated, it can remain in this superposition state and exhibit all that strange, wonderful goodness that we like to ascribe to quantum things. So we have a region of the world. We say the, the phenomena, just call it an object, it's, it's somewhere, certainly somewhere in our laboratory. It has to be there. <laughs> and then there's the rest of the world, okay? And if we can isolate that object from all of its interactions with the world, then we can ascribe it to these superposition states. But as soon as it interacts with its surroundings, things such as air molecules or, e or even uh, other, other quantum things like photons of light, the superposition quickly deteriorates. And the more complex the object is, the more interactions it will have with its environment and the faster this process unfolds. So for example, take a, a dust grain and have it floating in the dead of space as far as possible from anything else, maybe somewhere behind me there. Uh, no, not even starlight, imagine, just complete near vacuum of space. And you put it in a superposition of two locations here and there, separated by about the width of the grain. And in less than a second, it will cease to be in that state and will occupy one of these usual here or there states. If you took that grain uh, of 
of dust and then had it in Earth's atmosphere, it would happen for all intents and purposes instantaneously. So in effect, for for everyday things, there are no superpositions. So let's suppose that that dust grain is in one of these typical simple object is here states. So this statement comes obviously with a lot of implicit context, as I've been saying, but what it means is that if we were to perform an experiment that reveals the location of the particle, it would be found in one particular spot. Okay? Experiments and measurements are something we take for granted at our human scales, but it's actually one of the most confronting lessons quantum physics teaches us, and that is that measurement requires some interaction with the object of investigation. And it's the context of that measurement that defines the possible outcomes that provide us with information. So when we're talking about things, we we're, we we try to compartmentalize them by creating this black circle on your screen and saying that there's an object in there, but none of the things we can say about it have any meaning until we define the context of the interactions that we're going to have with it. So superpositions of here and there are just not among the possible states that can be observed if we set up some experimental arrangement to measure the position of the dust grain. There are, of course, other measurements. They're called interference experiments. I just put a little sci-fi type picture on there because they're quite complicated that you can do to reveal superposition states. But those are not position measurements and they are extremely difficult to perform. As noted before, such an experiment would at least require an environment more extreme than deep space if I wanted to find a superposition of a grain of dust. Perhaps one day we might perform one of these interference experiments with a grain of dust. However, even in that case, there would be absolutely no sense in asking what the superposition state looks like because looking would necessitate a different kind of measurement, which doesn't have superposition states as its possible outcomes. The only thing such an experiment would look like is data shown to you on the screen, just more information. So if the interactions between things and a dust screen did not provide information about its location, the superposition state would be maintained. However, the entire concept of location, things being here and there, would be irrelevant in such a situation. It's this proliferation of location information that gives these here and there superposition states meaning at all and why it features in our theories. In effect, our everyday world is a collection of particles with locations because they all mutually encode the positions of each other. If it were otherwise, we would not exist. Superposition, though seemingly mysterious, is actually quite boring. It's the simple classical here and there states that provide all this beauty and complexity of our human experience. Quantum physics is really a theory about isolation. And as such, it doesn't apply to you and nor would you want it to. And I think that's, you know, that's all there is to it. That's quantum physics. Quantum physics at its core is a theory about isolation. It doesn't apply directly to our macroscopic experiences and we wouldn't want it to be the case. The catch is that if you seek an intuitive understanding or a mental image of quantum phenomenon, you can't attain it. There's no quantum world for us to visit, observe, or even imagine. The moment we try to phrase a question about it, we inevitably alter the subject of our study. And because it's not an element of reality, but an object within some narrative story that's contextualized by how we aim to investigate the world. Quantum physics at its core serves as a framework for crafting these mathematical stories, each of which is contextualized by the specific questions we intend to ask. It allows us to make sense of features of the world defined by their inaccessibility, even though it may defy our intuition and everyday experiences. By accepting this fundamental nature of quantum physics, we can better appreciate the beauty and complexity it brings to our understanding of the universe. In the end, quantum physics has taught me that quantum physics is not the place to find truth. But more than that, it has taught me that truth doesn't lie out there in the world. It actually lies within. I wanna draw um, an analogy here, uh, since 
it, it's it's uh it's on my mind um so i don't know if you if you've seen it but my son loves this show alone now, the basic premise is that a, a group of contestants are separated and sent to remote places in some part of the world to live in complete isolation and whoever lasts the longest wins now they're given a camera and tripods to constantly film themselves because it's a tv show but they can also bring a small set of pre-approved items most bring obvious things associated with survival take for example a knife multi-tool pot fishing net sleeping bag food rations so on uh, however the participants can bring one thing that clearly is not associated with physical survival uh, they can bring a photograph now, the survival items are focused on meeting the physical needs of the contestants of the show. These items help them with practical aspects such as building shelters, starting fires, hunting, gathering food and water, that sort of stuff. Uh, and similarly, in real life, the storytelling tools of a model builder are used to understand the natural world, explain phenomenon, and find solutions to tangible problems. I'm going to summarize that just for <laughs> simplicity as science. So let's call that science. Uh, on the other hand, spirituality represented by the non-survival related items addresses the emotional and psychological needs of the contestants. These items like this family photo provide mental support, comfort, and a sense of connection to something greater than themselves. In life, spirituality often serves to fulfill emotional and psychological needs, helping individuals find meaning, purpose, and inner peace. The experiences of the contestants on The Alone Show uh, show that both physical survival skills and emotional resilience are essential to success in the competition. If you've seen the show, you'll immediately know what I'm talking about. And, and this can be seen as an analogy for life, where a balance between scientific knowledge and spiritual well-being is important for leading a fulfilling and well-rounded existence. Every contestant on the show eventually admits that the game is not about physical survival, but an emotional battle against themselves. And I think this is true in real life as well, uh, where many people often turn to spirituality in search of emotional comfort, often seeking a sense of connectedness to something greater than themselves, a search for meaning and purpose in their life, and a focus on personal growth or self-improvement of some form. So, uh, an extreme view from like a scientific lens might be something like this. Uh, I, I don't necessarily ascribe to it, but so, you know, a, a caricature of a, a, of a scientist <laughs> out in the world might say, only some people need the comforts of spirituality, but everyone needs science. Now, this is a bit naive because even hard-nosed physicalists turn to something for their emotional well-being. They just don't call it spirituality. Scientific inquiry begins with observation, identifying patterns in the world that warrant some explanation and potentially eventually control. Researchers then develop mathematical models to represent, understand, and communicate these patterns in a simplified manner. Over time, these models may enable us to simulate and manipulate aspects of our world, which in turn enhances our understanding of it. The key aspect of scientific pursuit is that these patterns we study and the findings we share are accessible to all people, transcending cultural and geographic boundaries. Science serves as a powerful tool for fostering connectedness, not only with our, our societies, but also between humanity and the cosmos. By engaging with scientific inquiry, we can gain a deeper appreciation for the interconnectedness of our world and our place within it. And this understanding provides us with a sense of purpose personal growth, and fulfillment that parallels what many seek through spiritual practices. The scientists have this implicit kind of notion of spirituality. And I think the scientific endeavor is really the ultimate avenue for cultivating the emotional comfort and connectedness that all people desire. There's Carl Sagan. And he famously said, we are made of star stuff. You've probably heard the quote. Um, actually, so the whole, the whole paragraph is, is quite poetic. <laughs> uh, 
But this this small statement emphasizes this idea that atoms and elements that make up our bodies and everything around us were formed in the nuclear reactions occurring inside of stars. When stars reach the end of their life cycles, they explode in supernova, releasing elements into the universe. Over time, those elements come together to form new stars, planets, and eventually, at least on one of them, life. So the elements that constitute our bodies, like the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the stuff around us, were once a part of a star. So Sagan's statement really underscores that all living beings share this common cosmic origin. We were all part of the same star. And this realization is, I think, meant to send, uh, foster sort of a sense of unity and interconnectedness among people that transcends all of the usual boundaries that are meant to divide us, like race, religion, and nationality. So let me talk about theosophy for a second. So I took this. Um, I took this from uh, the Theosophical Society's website. So quoting, except for um, when I wrote this down, Grammarly asked me to fix the Oxford comma. So there's an Oxford comma in there that isn't part of <laughs> your uh, your objects. Um, so the object uh, of Theosophy is threefold. Again, which I quote. So one to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste or color, two, to encourage the comparative study of religion, philosophy, and science, and three, to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in humanity. Okay, so I'm 100% on board with number one and two, which I'd summarize in my own words, much uh, fewer words as one, be kind, two, think like an applied mathematician. Okay, so great, on, on board with that. Uh, but point three is kind of where I get off the train that is just about to derail. Okay, so again, uh, this is quoted from the website uh, to try to explain what this third object means. So just to remind you to investigate and explain laws of nature and the powers latent in humanity. Okay, so the third object encourages us to investigate what sometimes has been called the hidden side of life and of human beings. The emphasis, color emphasis here is my own. Um, Theosophy holds that it is very important to learn about the deep purpose of life and the spiritual laws that guide our evolution, and also to discover how to awaken the spiritual potential that lies in every one of us. Now, I suspect every scientist I know would kind of scoff at this for being what is known as pseudo profound vagary. It, it sounds important, so people think that it's meaningful, but worse, it acts as a license to engage in unfounded speculation and to treat unverified claims as established facts. This approach leads to the spread of misinformation and pseudoscience, while there are certainly value in exploring the unknown and pushing the boundaries of our understanding, it's crucial that we do so within a rigorous methodology with skepticism and a commitment to evidence-based inquiry. Now, I'm not here to debunk mystical thinking. That has been done many times over, or you can read the book that I mentioned. <laughs> uh, but if you aren't convinced already, I don't think there's anything I can say in 30 minute YouTube video that's going to change your point of view on the matter. What I wanna do instead is provide you with a different perspective on the gap that I think spirituality is meant to be filling. Okay. So Carl Sagan's answer was just, you know, science, uh, but there's kind of great subtlety in that. So as you may be aware, one can easily treat science as a religion. Uh, it even has a name, scientism. So scientism goes beyond the appreciation of scientific methods and facts, asserting that science is the only valid means of acquiring knowledge and that all other forms of inquiry, such as philosophy, religion, or spirituality, are somehow inherently inferior to science. Now, this view, uh, people that hold this view, feel, their point of view is that scientists uh, are meant to remove themselves from their theories, aiming to present an objective representation of the world. 
And by doing so, they hope to establish a set of rules or physical laws that govern the fundamental constituents of the universe. Now, I think these people, both the scientists that strive to remove themselves from their theories and the followers of scientism are deeply confused. But the concept of universal laws of nature bears a very similar resemblance to the universal truths sought in theosophy. So I think the confusion inherent inherent in scientism parallels that in, in theosophy. Many people, they're insatiably curious. They're desperate, desperately seeking for simple answers for everything, believing that there's one single all-encompassing solution. Some individuals may possess superficial knowledge in various areas, but they're unwilling to invest the time and effort required to go deeper, which is what is required for true understanding. And this lack of depth ultimately leaves them feeling confused and constantly grasping at straws. I have this <laughs> grasping at straws analogy because I imagine that uh, in in this picture, someone's hoping to discover you know some profound truth that they can suck <laughs> out of out of out of the straw. And they, they, there's this expectation that if if something is just told in the right way or by the right person or at the right time, then suddenly it will magically make everything clear to them. They're searching for this sort of aha moment uh, that will believe, you know, bring this instant clarity. However, I think in all of these cases, one fails to recognize that such moments don't exist. Gaining true understanding requires time, patience, and the acceptance that there really is no final definitive answer. And embracing this reality helps us approach life with humility and a genuine desire to learn and grow. Sagan's star stuff statement serves as a powerful reminder that our cosmic heritage, fostering a sense of wonder, unity, humility, and an eagerness to learn about the universe we inhabit. Now, scientists like Sagan, they're usually hesitant to provide explicit guidance beyond cultivating just this awe for science, which you know in, in itself could be considered a problem. Uh, this very nature of our existence that I mentioned can serve as, as a guiding light. So those stars you're made of began as one thing, hydrogen. For hundreds of millions of years, back at the beginning of the universe, it was just a cold abyss of this faint hydrogen dust. Gravity started clumping it all together and galaxies formed into clustered filaments resembling swirling milk poured into black coffee, as you can see here. <laughs> but as we watch the milk disperse in a cup of coffee, eventually making a latte, say, something magical happens, right? The drop turns into these beautiful ribbons of complexity. If you repeat the process again, you'll see different structures emerge. No two patterns are ever alike, but they're always there. And in our universe, we are in this middle stage where these ribbons of complexity streak all the way across the cosmos, creating these filaments that connect the galaxies, one of which we are a part of. But the fate of the universe is exactly like the cup of coffee. The swirls of complexity will fade and decay, as all things do, and the universe will return to a cold, dark abyss. As you can see in the cup of coffee, the ribbons appear and dissipate in one continuous act. The complexity grows and disappears. It's very fleeting. It grows up to a maximum and then immediately starts to shrink, and it never returns. Yet, Somehow in the small corner of the universe on this tiny blue rock, complexity seems to thrive. What it's doing is replicating. Now, how and why this happened, we don't actually know, but we definitely know that it did. <laughs> and it seems to be the only antidote to this overarching force in the universe, which is decay. That life happened is blindingly obvious. <laughs> That uh, which we see around us is that which has survived. And we don't see things that didn't make copies of themselves, that didn't replicate, because they succumb to decay before replicating. So imagine some new species that 
cropped up but but can't procreate we will never know that it even existed um there could be billions of these these sorts of things but you are one of the things that that replicates uh however you might ask what exactly is being copied by replicators like you now we might naively think that it's matter like the stuff of which it is made of that defines the copy like a true physical copy of something contains obviously an equal amount of stuff but somehow that's not enough right a random mass of organic molecules is likely to be a formless mush not a living thing what is actually copied is information it's the information that defines the configurations of matter embodied in these physical things yet when you really think about it there's so much information contained in you that will never exist beyond the decay of your physical body yes you'll copy your dna and your genes will be passed on but your ideas dreams and imagination which grow like these complex ribbons across the synapses of your brain they are as fleeting as one of these drops of drops of milk in the coffee unless of course you crystallize them by encoding those patterns in the world around you the goal of life apparently is to live to just survive but it's not actually the physical stuff that you're currently made of that needs to survive that changes all the time it's the information contained within you so the meaning of life is to perpetuate information far into the future there are really only two possibilities to consider we can have the decayed remains of fleeting complexity that's long forgotten impossible to recover or a part of us evidencing this last fight against decay you are a unique embodiment of cosmic complexity and you have a choice to make will you allow the energy within you to dissipate into the void or will you harness it to manifest complexity preserving the essence of who you are and contributing to the story of the universe throughout the eons that preceded your existence you had no influence yet now you stand at this precipice of a future that your actions can actually shape so i want to tell you to embrace the storytelling ability within you and be like the stars you're made of which build complexity into the cosmos and challenge the steady march of decay in doing so you will honor this cosmic heritage that has been given to you and i want to finally just share uh my final interpretation of the objects of the theosophy that i think will provide you with hopefully a, a different and unique perspective now i don't think any of this is at odds with the stated objectives but i kind of submit it to you as an alternative interpretation so number 1 as i said be kind number 2 be like an applied mathematician create useful stories and number 3 embrace the meaning in life and make the universe a more interesting place before you have to give your borrowed atoms back to it thank you